For Microbe TV, this is Tuivo, This Week in Evolution, episode number 88, recorded on March 22nd, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Nels Eldi. Hey, Vincent. Greetings from... Aldi Lab Studios. Good to be back with you for the 88th occasion we've had to sit down and talk science together. Looking it's the to piano it. episode, Nels. <laughs> That's right. There you go. Each each episode, <laughs> like a key on the piano, playing a different scientific note. Um, Good to see you again, Nels. You have a little bit of a, a shearing there on your head, right? You got a haircut. Yeah, a little <laughs> spring cleaning. So um, <clears throat> it was getting out of hand. And so I was able to sneak in a quick appointment to to um, yeah, get ready. And actually, I need to. I needed to lighten up a little bit. So heading to um, Puerto Rico, San Juan, Puerto Rico tomorrow yeah. uh, for the Pew annual meeting. I'll be kind of in the background, lurking around, and hanging out with incredibly talented scientists doing really cool stuff. And so yeah, looking forward to catching some sun, accelerating the process of winter moving into spring, and um, hopefully, I'll look the part. Can accelerate your aging too in this time, you know. <laughs> That's right. If you want to feel do that. like it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, welcome everyone for the first of two live streams today. I'm I'm crazy. I scheduled two in one day, Nels. But good for you. I love it. You know, uh, welcome everyone. Let me welcome our moderators here today. We have Tom. Uh, we have Barb Mac, UK. We have Les. We have Andrew. And I think that just about does it. Let's scroll. Everyone is very vocal today. They're chatting like <laughs> crazy. That's great. We're happy to give you a forum from whence to chat. Uh, and so thank you, folks, for for being here for that uh, moderating. And let's see where people are from just for a few minutes here. Yeah, I love it. Let's go around the horn. Let's see. Other Shade is from Amsterdam. That's pretty cool. Uh, Tom is in U Eugene, Oregon today. Uh, Jan is in Tucson. Yeah, I I think that we should leave our our clocks alone, right, Nels? <laughs> I hate this changing back and forth, but yeah. we don't have any choice. We're at the mercy of our politicians and all things in our life, including science. Apparently, we have to be at the mercy of our bloody politicians. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a mixed bag on that one. I agree. I'm still suffering, I feel like, from that one-hour time change. At the same time, I like these as sort of a night owl. I like the the late sunlight through the summer, so I don't know what the right answer is. I have to say quickly, I was just in Tucson um, uh, about a week mm -hmm. and a half ago for a really fun immunobiology symposium. Cool. And so, yeah, great. And first time I think I've been to Tucson, really great town, and got in a quick hike among the saguaro cactus, which was really invigorating, so... Great. Great to have you here. Barb Mack is from the UK. Uh, Nicole is from Italy. Uh, Les, I know, is from California. Andrew is from New Zealand. That's pretty cool. Yeah, Lise welcome. is from cloudy Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> if, you, if you see the um, bobblehead doll of me behind me there, see? <laughs> I do, yeah. That, that's a gift of Lise. Oh, That's wow. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Very cool. Let's see. Who else do we have here? Uh, Nebraska, Rima. Hello, Rima from Nebraska. Welcome That's back. pretty cool. Uh, what else? We have uh, Neva from Buda, Texas. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, – so we, Nels and I were just talking about Twivo number 100, mm -hmm. which will happen probably in 2024, and we're thinking about – Doing it out. What is it outside of Austin? A few miles. Yeah, uh, not, a few not hours. Far from, not far from Buda. Uh, about a, yeah, hour, hour and a half west of Austin, the hill country of Texas, near Johnson City, the Science Mill, it's an interactive science museum I'm involved with, and so we might put out some feelers and see if there's a possibility for doing something fun in person in vivo, Twivo in vivo, Twivo 100. It's already rolls off the tongue. There's some good. <laughs> Be a while before we hit a thousand, huh? We'll keep you posted, Neva. We might. Need some assists right. there nearby in Buda. Thanks. Uh, Renzo's from Ontario. Uh, Matt is from San Francisco. Uh, M.E. Wheeler is from Helsinki. That's pretty cool. Very cool. Welcome MK all. M.K. is from eastern Massachusetts. 
Tomball, Texas. Lori, oh, that's interesting. Oh, very cool. Uh, next time I have to bring this monitor closer. I can barely see it. Uh -oh. <laughs> Peter's from Colorado. Genetics 2 is from Arizona. Philip nice. is from Wales. That's cool. Mm. Avdesh is from India. I love the I love the another Texan here. I love the geographical diversity here, right? I do too. Were you mentioning Vincent? There's like a app that allows you to like project dots on the map. Yeah, somehow. I could that, put all these people on a map. I really should get that. Louisville, Kentucky, Manchester, England, hmm. uh, Vancouver, BC. Uh, here we have San Jose. Oh, Vanity, our other moderator, didn't see you before. Yeah, welcome. Vanity's from the New York region. Welcome. Uh, Awak Awatuki, Arizona. How about that? That's, a, yeah. New All right. For me. Wow. Very cool. Welcome, everybody. Uh, and uh, today we're going to we're gonna just throw it all out to the dogs, right? <laughs> That's right. The dog days of Tuivo are here upon us again. Yeah. So, Vincent, we've done some episodes on dogs and how, like, this becomes a system to, to think about evolution. Um, yeah. Actually, let me try to recall some of these. So, we're not too long ago, Tuivo 85, actually, uh, teaching old dogs new genetic tricks. And this was um, one of the authors on the paper we'll be discussing um, today uh, is on the paper or was on, will reappear. This is Elaine Ostrander. She's not the senior author of the work we'll be talking about today. But the um, episode 85 looks at all of the dog breeds and tries to get at the genetic basis of some behavioral traits. Um, and, you know, advancing sort of with new technology, new tools, advancing some of those ideas, still sort of a work in progress. I think we'll see that even more. This also got me recalled. Um, do you remember that episode we did? This is a while ago. I think Tuivo 46. Can an <laughs> old tumor teach us new Ah, tricks? yes. All about <laughs> the Tasmanian tumors, right? Well, similar. So these are the canine venereal yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, right, tumors. Right. And so in that case, the dogs aren't really the star of the evolution show, um, but the tumors they carry are. And this is this remarkable, you know, thousands of years of these tumors hitchhiking from dog to dog um, yeah. through transmission. And then as the dogs sort of moved out to different geography across the globe, different points on the map, the tumors um, had sort of or have their own sort of genetic kind of signatures. And I think that the one detail that still sticks in my mind is the dogs living near the equator, their tumors have more mutations consistent with UV damage. And so mm, mm -hmm. that was really a, a, a fun insight from that work. And so we're, <laughs> We're back to the dogs, um, as you're saying. And I think there's a great connection here from one of our moderators, Barb Mack. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yes. Barb, Barb uh, was the one who brought this to our attention. She wrote an email not too long ago. Uh, I came across this paper after reading an article about the dogs, some feral, some domestic, who survived the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. And apparently, along with their descendants, are still striving in the area. So she sent the link to the paper, which we'll do today. The Dogs of Chernobyl, Demographic Insights into Populations Inhabiting the Nuclear Exclusion Zone. It's also a Stat News article. And uh, she commented that uh, Elaine Ostrander, one of the authors, heads up a research group on dog genomes and also is involved in sequencing the genomes. Uh, she'd be great to have on Tuivo. Totally fascinating subject, how radiation affects a population's evolution and, of course, has implications for humans. I, I, it wasn't enough time to reach out to Elaine because she's at NIH and it takes a long time to get approval there. So yeah. uh, I couldn't have her on, but we'll, we'll try and do it justice, right, Nels? <laughs> That's right. We'll do the, the best we can. Um, and so, and, to be, and thank you, Barb, for bringing this up. This is actually, you know, as listeners, participants, contributors to Tuivo, we're always on the lookout for cool stuff and what you're seeing that catches your attention. And so this is a perfect example of that. And then, of course, Barb is one of the moderators helping kind of navigate our conversations. And so thank you on multiple fronts there. Um, and so as you mentioned, Vincent, Elaine, uh, let's talk about the authors for a moment. So Elaine Ostrander is one of the one of the key ones here, one of the real leaders in the field when we think about the genetics, the sort of population dynamics of dogs, and has been for decades. Um, the lead authors on this one, it's um, a lab in the Department of Biological Sciences, University of South Carolina. This is um, Timothy Mousseau, 
um, and uh, first author Gabrielle Spatola. Um, and my sense from reading the stat um, article that Barb uh, nicely included here, and if um, we'll include that link as well in the show notes, um, is that um, you know the group here has been uh, Timothy Musso's group has been thinking about this question about you know what are the genetic implications on animals that live wildlife and other animals that live um, in and around Chernobyl. Um, thinking, of course, about the nuclear accident that happened in the mid 80s. And so um, the and I, most of the work, my impression is it's been happening in, in rodents or that you can trap pretty easily or in you know amphibians or other small critters. Um, harder to do in mammals, big mammals in particular, outside of the rodents. And so um, it was sort of this you know great situation where because the population of dogs is growing um, in and around Chernobyl, there's um, some attention, some you know interventions to spay and neuter some of these dogs. And actually, that might influence evolution into the future here, but we can maybe touch on that a little bit. Um, and in doing that, collecting blood, which then opens up the possibility for the first time to have samples to really look at what might be going on here in terms of the, the genetics. And so um, and um, the way it's told in the stat article is then the Mousseau group then reached out to Elaine and they've teamed up in, I think, some really interesting ways as they sort of lay the groundwork for potentially some really interesting studies into the future. One of the authors now is uh, Norman Kleiman is an uh, assistant professor at Columbia University. Mm. And last week I, I gave a talk at a, uh, a biosafety meeting. You know, mm -hmm. all the mm -hmm. biosafety people from the region uh, get together. And uh, he was on the program he spoke last. It was too late. I had to leave. Oh, but shoot. his talk yeah. was on Chernobyl, an environmental, ecological, and radiological disaster. There you go. Too bad I missed, the... too bad I missed it. Right? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, right on the money for what we'll be talking about today. Um, some of the other authors here, we won't do the kind of the, just for the interest of time, we want to sort of an exhaustive listing, but there are, you know, representatives, folks um, from Chernobyl, Ukraine, the state specialized enterprise um, eco center. Um, this is Ihor um, Chevesky, sorry, I'm sure I'm getting the pronunciation wrong there. Um, and, and others, there's sort, of, sort of this international consortium of, of folks, I think there's some researchers from Poland, um, who are sort of pulling together to make this work possible. Um, and that, I think it maybe sort of hints at the high degree of difficulty here, given, uh, well, uh, both the accident that traces back to the mid eighties and all of the literal fallout from that, but as well as like current events in, in and around Chernobyl in and around Ukraine, given the war, um, with Russia. And so the fact that, you know, this kind of study is possible at all might be because this happened, you know, I think most of the samples were collected. 2000, starting in 2017 through 2019, but I'm guessing there are some obvious new challenges and roadblocks that are um, in place now, at least for the foreseeable future. So maybe to begin, Vincent, we, could, we should talk a little bit about the history of the accident here. And so the authors, I think, nicely just summarize some of the key points. Um, you know, So we're back in sp uh, spring of 1986, there's a steam explosion at the nuclear power plant that burned for 10 days. So massive releases of cesium-137, iodine-131, and other um, radionuclides. Um, and the result is what continues to be a pretty massive exclusion zone of um, 2,600 square kilometers. Um, a really big impact. I guess, you know, for a comparison point, the Fukushima nuclear accident that happened, when was that, maybe 12 years ago or so in Japan, um, coming up on 12 years, uh, very small compared to that. And so this raises, you know, some of the issues about what, you know, sort of the impacts of this from uh, both the acute and longer term impacts of being wildlife as humans have immediately evacuated. Um, there's now been this sort of ongoing history of wildlife moving in and then sort of expanding and sort of running um, uh, almost an uh, accidental experiment in what it means for wildlife to have sort of open access without so much of the influence of humans, but you know, this also this massive trade-off, which is ongoing exposure to a pretty polluted environment. Um, 
And so I think, you know, on the acute side, the authors point out, there's a lot of wildlife, a lot of animals were killed right at the beginning. And then, um, so there's certainly going to be from a genetic standpoint or evolution standpoint, there are going to be, you know, pretty big bottlenecking events. And then, um, some interesting questions, provocative questions about the impact of ongoing exposure to mutagenic pollution, all of the radioisotopes that are still circulating around. Um, it's, really, it's kind uh, of interesting that, uh, you know, no, no ma large bodies and mammals have been studied, uh, after the disaster there, and that's one of the impetuses for doing this one uh, mm -hmm. in dogs here. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, what you'd like to, what you'd like to eventually know is whether the radiation has affected uh, genetic diversity at all, right? If mutation has, we, you might get increased mutation rates, right, in the in the genomes of whatever you look at. So, what's the effect of that? But also, you know, the the initial explosions killed a lot of animals. So as, as you said, you're going to have a bottleneck and you're going to reduce diversity. So there's going to be two competing factors there. You'd like to sort out uh, what's going on. And this dog population, apparently they're feral dogs, right? They're roaming around after the explosion. A lot, some people think they're descended from pets who were left yeah. behind, right? Pripyat had a big population, 50,000 people. Mm -hmm. uh, and they all got evacuated. They left their pets behind and uh, you know the Ukrainian government started to cull them but dogs are pretty smart and they some of them escaped the culling mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, they <laughs> ran away and apparently the workers who are cleaning up take care of some of these dogs so they're thriving because I always wonder what are they going to eat uh, yeah that's right <clears throat> you know a pet dog gets released are they going to be uh, any good at catching uh, anything or scavenging or whatever so yeah, exactly. So potentially several pretty strong selection events, I would say, like the acute um, accident itself. Like one of the hypotheses then is that the authors are hoping to kind of get into deep, into more depth, maybe in the future as well, is, um, you know, is there, are these animals, so if, obviously, so after they survive the acute incident, is there something special about their genetic background that they do better? Um, yeah. include, like, yeah. you know, they, they are able to reproduce where maybe some of others in the population can't because they have, um, you know, some mutations and DNA repair, you know, you can, you can sort of build potential stories or hypotheses that way. But, you know, as you point out, then as the dogs sort of recover or as, and start breeding and thriving, then, um, you know, they start to call the population. Is that another selection event? Like yeah, if you're sure. good at avoiding hunters, is that, <laughs> yes. you know, yes. is that signal in there somewhere? And, and yeah. so, yeah, getting a sense of the, um, of some of the demographics here, um, uh, very important if you want to sort of make a, a real stab at how selection might be acting at different levels. Yeah. Yeah. And also there's some idea that these dogs have been breeding with other dogs, right? Yeah. Uh, other feral dogs or maybe even purebred dogs who have escaped. And, and probably some of these were originally purebred dogs as pets and so forth. So exactly a, right. these are all interesting population genetics questions, right? That's right. And so, um, and, you know, getting to one of the, your first point there. Um, so humans aren't, uh, you know, completely, so the evacuated early, but have come back in yeah, um, right. in order to, try to maintain the site of the abandoned power plant so that it, you know, the ecological disaster doesn't become worse. That's ongoing and probably like higher, even higher degree of difficulties based on some of the recent news stories with the um, war that's going on. Um, and then, um, yeah. And so as humans are kind of returning in one form or another at these different locations, what do humans do? They bring their dogs with them. And so is there ongoing breeding? And I think you'd want to know that, right? So if you have new intergressions or new, sort of, you know, purebred breeding coming in after, and these are going to be largely pets that aren't exposed to the radiation that could start to make your genetic signals more complicated. And so I think that's it is to really try to get a sense of what's the, the, the noise from just the structure of the population so that you in the future might be able to discern what signal, what are the real sort of evolutionary events that have, might be unfolding sort of in the last several decades here um, in, a, in a very small bottleneck population. Now, see, you may wonder how they did this with feral <laughs> dogs, <Yeah>. <laughs> but there is actually something called the Chernobyl Dog Research Ini Initiative, which was formed in 2017 as the dog population got big. It was once over 800 uh, individual dogs. 
And so clinics were established to provide veterinary care. And then when these dogs were brought in, uh, then they would sample their blood. And so that's where they got these the blood, because that's what you need here. You just need blood sample to do some genome analysis. They got blood samples from uh, 302 dogs. Uh, they, uh, and they were preserved, you know, so they were sampled some time ago. Yep. Uh, and so some of them are from um, one clinic, which is inside the industrial areas of the Chernobyl what is it, the CNPP, the Chernobyl Nuclear Power Nuclear Plant. Power Plant. So that's one of the acronyms. And the other is the CEZ, the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone. Yep, right. which includes the CNPP and then also some area around there. Um, right. not, not just some area, 2,600 yeah. square kilometers. That's a pretty massive. It includes Chernobyl City, yeah. um, which is another site. I think that's where the second clinic that they set up was. And they got something like 150 dogs from that population. Um, current human population, I guess, in Chernobyl City is something like a little under 500. So there are, yeah, there are humans right. there. Again, people who are like, you know, working to try to keep the, the situation from getting worse or keep it stable. Or, so they have um, their own clinic there mm -hmm. for dogs in Chernobyl City. Mm -hmm. And again, these are feral dogs, right? They're not pets, right? Exactly. And so 130 samples from in and around the plant. Um, and then I think 16 more from um, a little bit farther away as sort of a, but a nearby comparison point. And then as you're saying, yeah. Vincent, you've got, you get the blood, you can get the DNA and um, from the genomes. And then for this analysis, they're doing SNPs. So these are signal, they're, they're typing single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are one letter changes um, that have been picked, sort of highlighted as ones that are, you know, sort of, there's variation there. And so you can, by putting together the patterns of, of SNPs, the A, T, C, or G change at that DNA position, you can start to get a sense of relatedness and some of the other population genetic dynamics among the popu uh, uh, among the, the dogs sampled. And so this is, they do about 130,000 SNPs, but they have enough material to do whole genome analysis. And I think that's probably in progress right now, but this is really yeah. sort of a yeah. preview or almost like a appetizer um, for some of the work ahead. 129,000 SNPs. From three, these 302 samples. And this is where, you know, all of the interest in dog genetics really comes into play to prioritize the out of the, you know, many more possible positions. What are the ones that might be most informative for some of the, the measures and tests to, to sort of discern what the relationship is between these populations? And, and then compare, and the really imp key imp point here, right, is to then compare this to other free breeding dog populations around the world. Is there something special or different about these guys, these dogs, um, given that recent um, pretty traumatic and ongoing um, challenging uh, history of living in and around a nuclear power plant disaster area? So some of the some of the break breeds we're going to talk about are going to sound familiar from that last paper we did, right? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And there's like a whole, you know, cottage industry <laughs> in dog genetics, sort of 23 and me of dogs. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting the, there's, I mean, there's several, yeah, That's there's good. several, um, you know, outfits where a lot of people, and I'm sure like some of our listeners, I'm guessing have probably sent some samples to get their dog and you get back, you know, your dog's breed is X percent pincher, X percent German shepherd, X, you know, and that, those kind of things. And, and, and so that, again, that sort of massive and growing data bank of information, um, largely from pets is really a valuable resource for um, thinking about the genetics here. Sort of bootstraps or, or, or puts the sort of um, you know analysis. You can go a lot farther, a lot faster, given all of this interest and in, in the resources. Yeah. Now, did you ever do that sort of thing on yourself <laughs> to see what you're made up of? <laughs> the twenty three me. So I'll, yeah, I haven't. So I or, I went as far as ordering the kit, um, mm -hmm. and then I don't know where I. I mean, I'm not so people. I think are raise like important points about genetic privacy and things like that. With, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think that was really what stopped me from doing it. Um, I don't know. I haven't done it. How about you? Have you? Yeah, I did. I yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I did actually the whole family. Hmm. Um, but uh, I don't remember anyone. But mine was, I'm, I'm pretty much all Italian, right? Because my, yeah. my father was born in Italy and my mother was born to Italian parents. So I'm um, basically, you know, 90 some percent Italian snips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> makes sense. I've had I have had family members do some um, in some cases like genome level analysis as well, not just SNPs. And so, um, yeah, some mm -hmm. of the privacy stuff is out the window. I mean, we've seen some of these cases, right? Where uh, and I'm not like 
planning to become a serial killer or anything, but um, where, you know, actually forensic evidence has been traced back given relatives that sort of participate this. And so, you know, it is, yeah, it's, it's really interesting to see how this technology is unfolding kind of in real time, how that's being linked in some cases to sort of revealing identities and things like that as well. Well, I, I, I used to regularly get notices from people saying, you know, I'm related to you. And uh, some of them actually really are. And it can be revealing about your heritage. But I just stopped uh, responding. And, you know, they're, they're probably more and more all the time, but just didn't didn't follow up. You know? Yeah. Yep. No, it's fascinating. And that's getting more powerful as well. I would definitely like not – I don't like, have a recommendation one way or or another, but um, I'm sure sometime I'll take the plunge. Um, but anyway, so we, because you have all of this, um, you know, existing data, they could then very quickly take their samples, those 130,000 SNPs, and start to look at some sort of, um, you know, start to measure or compare or describe the population. And so one of the main kind of features that they use is so-called identity, identical by state, or identity by state, IDS, um, IBS. And, um, and this is like literally just asking, you know, do you have the same nucleotide? If so, between the samples, do you have the same nucleotide or the same DNA letter at the same location, the same SNP? And then you can cluster all of the, the whole data set based on this and see who's more related to each other um, and, and, sort of the, and start to look at the genetic structure there. And so what they see is actually some clear patterns. And this is in science, the journals in Science Advances this is open access so anyone can sort of follow along or pick this up for yourself. And um, in figure one, you see that they represent this. And in fact, the dogs that are, um, the samples that are from the ones at the CNPP, the power plant versus the ones um, in the town, like they generally cluster separately. So there's some population differentiation there um, that they identify. Oh yeah, we're here, we're moving there. Vincent's bringing it up. So the first sort of heat map is showing uh, literally a map of the sampling. The um, green circle, I think that's Chernobyl City. And then you've got the 132 up at the top there. And the, those are sort of, that's right at the power plant and in and around mm -hmm. that area. And then the clustering is just below there. So the um, purple, again, is the um, power plant. The green is Chernobyl City. And you can see there's more green on the right side of that um, cluster analysis and more purple on the left. Um, and then the comparisons, you, you do it across the top from left to right and then from top to bottom. Um, and you've got like all of the comparisons there, the cluster based on those 130,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. Uh, and so this is really useful because it can kind of, um, you know, the exceptions actually can be really interesting as well. So that sort of physically implies that there's some movement, some migration, um, and then and then that's sort of confirmed or um, corroborated by the fact that some of the SNPs are like shared between the, the different clusters as well. And so that's um, a, a sign of admixture or gene flow between these. So there's you know, these dogs are not just sort of like laying around and, and super lazy. At least some of them are migrating, they're breeding um, in different locations. And so there's some exchange of genetic material. But in general, um, you know, they're staying closer to home. Um, and, and, and that all makes sense. But that that kind of information becomes, that kind of demographical information becomes really important, um, again, to get that structure to then do more sophisticated analysis down the road where you might start to ask questions about, you know, signals of adaptation or natural selection. But uh, one of the things that <clears throat> comes out of this is that the, the gene flow is constrained by geography, which is what you would expect, right? Absolutely what you'd expect. And so I think there's not, you know, maybe in the end, there's not like massive surprises here from the analysis, but it does sort of give you the details of those exact things you'd expect. And so, for example, you know, we were mentioning ongoing breeding as people might be bringing their pets. And so you see they do a measure of heterozygosity. Um, and that sort of is a proxy for thinking about how much outbreeding is going on. So are the families, um, as they're living there, if they're all mating with each other, then the, you'll have a high, you'll have lower heterozygosity. You'll have more homozygosity as they become more inbred. And what's interesting is in the Chernobyl city ones where there's more humans, there's higher heterozygosity. There's more outcrossing, and that could be a signal, for example, of humans bringing in their pets from sort of outside as people show up at Chernobyl City, maybe people are rotating in and off of working at the power plant or nearby, monitoring the environment, all these things um, that are going on there. Um, and then that's going to influence, you know, the genetics. And so you, you kind of want to 
identify these signals and then try to figure out like where are they from and what's the impact of them. It will make future studies, I think, even more powerful. So now the heterozygosity is just basically at the level of a SNP, whether you have two copies of the same SNP or not, right? Exactly. One from the mother dog and one from the father dog. Um, and um, like each on the chromosomes from your dad and from your mom, if you're in this case, if you're a dog, exactly. Right. And so, yeah, and then they can, you know, also spin out some more analysis. So um, measures of uh, relatedness. So this is moving in to they use. So again, you've got all <clears throat> actually, they, I didn't go on a deep dive into the into the methods, but they don't for the next kind of level of analysis where they're using principal components, they use a pruned analysis set. So they actually don't use all 130,000. I'm not sure how much they pruned it, but they really wanted to, given that sort of first level of analysis, they wanted to say, okay, here are the SNPs that are sort of the most informative specifically for this population. There's the most sort of differentiation possible among them. And then from there, they can do sort of a, a, a other way of visualizing the relatedness between the animals and then sort of compare that again to outbreeding um, or free free breeding um, populations around the world. And they also throw in some of the purebred breeding as well, which is a very different sort of scenario where now humans are like, you know, very much influencing who's mating with who as you're sort of trying to live up to the kennel club expectations or, you know, <laughs> entering your dogs and dog shows or convincing people to buy your golden retriever that has all of the right sort of characteristics and genetic material there. Um, and so that's pretty interesting. I mean, there's like, so this is in figure two and they look at, you know, both by, so they look at clustering bo both by location and by breed. And so you can really see on some of the, the way the principal components are visualized here um, that the, um, the dots, the individual dogs that are being sampled sort of come together. And so for me, it kind of raised the question, like, is there actually like a Chernobyl breed of dog, which is, um, you know, sort of as defined as something like a, like a shepherd or something like that. Yeah. So we're looking here at panel B in mm -hmm. the middle. So the principal components are, there's two that, um, explain, I think, uh, 15% of variants from left to right and about 14.9 or 15% of variants from bottom to top. And, um, the, um, in panel B, the middle one here, they're color coding the dots based on the different dog breeds. And so their Chernobyl dogs are the sort of in right the here, right? lower right. Yeah. And the, um, right here, right? Uh, there it is. Yeah, exactly. And then the other breeds, you can kind of see, you know, what is like light green here, the Asian spits and related. So it's like that yeah. level. It's not like a specific, it's not like a, you know, a toy poodle level of a very specific breed. Um, but, like all poodles like sort of have that same sort of le level of relatedness as the Chernobyl ones. The Chernobyl ones are spread out a little bit more. That's overrepresented, you know, obviously in, um, to focus on that as, as part of the comparison, but it's pretty striking. I think um, that it's a, you know, 30 years or plus of, of breeding um, uh, in these sort of inbred populations, these small populations, highly bottleneck populations has given it its own sort of genetic differentiation have some Hungarians down here overlapping with the Chernobyl Sea. Yeah. And I think that makes sense kind of intuitively um, as well. You know, the um, in, in panel A, for example, actually looking at the geography, um, that there's going to be um, the dogs that are sort of nearby in Ukraine and Russian yeah. bred yep. dogs. They're sort of in the, yep, yeah, it starts to give you that kind of level of relationship. It's kind of hard. I mean, I think the human, like the PCA plots can be, sort of intuitive in the sense that you kind of get like who's clustering with who, how the data, you know, is all being crunched over hundred thousand SNPs looking for sort of shared features. It gets pretty complicated actually. And I don't think we'll get too bogged down in the weeds on, on some of those details, but definitely that starts to give you um, kind of landmarks and from a genetic standpoint for, yeah, uh, for what yeah. the populations look like. Yeah. And panel A, you can see the geographic segregation here between the Chernobyl city and then the, the CNPP, right? Yeah, that's right. And Different. so that's why they propose that there's actually two populations that sort of make sense, differentiated populations. Yeah. So you wouldn't take, you know, that entire um, exclusion zone, you know, the 2,600 square kilometers and just think of all these dogs as the same. There's exactly. a value in pulling exactly. it apart and yeah, and differentiating between the two, given them yep. there's more yep. outbreeding and other, uh, based on the heterozygosity, there's, there's more features going on there. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, and that's where, you know, for me, a key 
um, I don't think they went into a lot of detail, but, but a key consideration, I think, especially in um, sort of the work ahead is thinking about um, uh, uh, more closely, like what are the regions of the genome that make the most sense to analyze? And so here mm -hmm. what they do is they get into some of the haplotype analysis. And this, this is like directly drawn from the um, 23 and me of dog kind of energy, where this is how, like when you send in um, a sample from your dog and they come back and say, oh yeah, it's like 30% pit bull or, you know, or terrier, et cetera. Where this comes from is based on this sort of haplotype analysis where you're comparing it to, to other purebreds um, around the world. Um, and here what they bring back is mostly two haplotypes that are very much German shepherd. Um, and then also I think pincher is the other one. Um, and so those are probably, you know, getting at the um, abandoned pet hypothesis. Those were probably some of the founders or some of the dogs that really um, were um, were contributing to the um, genetic pool here. Um, and then that will, you know, by identifying these haplotypes, those are probably the best spots to look for signals of accumulated mutations that might actually have resulted from the radiation exposure. If that's sort of a, if that's having a selective um, impact or even, or if just having a mutational impact and then whether selection is acting on any of those mutations going forward, I think is another really interesting question. It's probably even harder to get at that. And so sort of laying this groundwork, identifying um, the pincher clade haplotypes, which were seen more common in the city dogs, the Chernobyl city dogs. Um, there was, you know, that those were their um, clear haplotypes, probably less radiation. I think they point out even um, 15 miles away or what are 10 miles away from sort of ground zero that the amount of radiation is, you know, between 10 to 400 times lower than it is actually in the CNPP in the power plant. And so, um, so that might not be the place to look for like the most impactful, um, you know, radiation sort of signatures, but the shepherd haplotypes and which are found more at the power plant, they point out that this, like these, these might be comparison points for the impacts of radiation exposure. And I think what they call like scarring of the genome. So these would be genetic mutations that, that really change, um, you know, the, the nature of the chromosome in some cases. And there could be, um, I don't actually, I'm not sure if their analysis would have picked this up yet, but there could even be, you know, things like not just point mutations, but things like inversions, copy number things, some like kind of big, um, genome rearrangement level events that would be interesting if, if that happens. Which they um, wouldn't have picked up in this analysis, right? I don't think so. Yeah. And so this would probably like point to where to look, um, yeah. for those kind of things. I think it might also be important to note, like, I don't know I don't, about you, Vincent, but for me, you know, I think you just think about how impactful this accident was, the high levels of radiation, some of those acute exposures. And it's like, I don't know, I still have this almost like Bart Simpson level where they, they, you know, Bart's dad, Homer Simpson works by the nuclear power plant and they show in the cartoon, like the three eyed fish jumps out of the water like these. Mm. I don't think there's been um, much evidence of those like massive morphological impacts or, you know, but, but that doesn't mean there aren't sort of like really consequential genetic mutations or, or changes that are sure, going on. Sure. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know, this is like kind of outside my um, field or by my expertise, but also even thinking about like, um, you know, I wonder if just like dogs or the ancestors of dogs, the ancestors of mammals, if you trace back that there've been all kinds of like really extreme environmental exposures that have happened yeah, for sure. hundreds of millions of years. And so, you know, is that already like, it's a pretty high bar, like our populations of mammals are already pretty buffered, like, you know, our population, other populations, um, have survived some pretty ma like meteor level strike kind of, you know, impacts. And so when we now look at if sample modern species is, are, are already the DNA repair pathways, et cetera, um, pretty robust and in place. And so that might already buffer in some ways, some of the potential sort of impacts that might be, uh, that might otherwise happen. Well, that's, that's why this kind of study is important to figure out if, you know, there's minimal impact or is there something big going on? And I don't know if they would have mentioned it if they'd found it, but I look forward to the future analysis. Yeah, agreed. So, this yeah, and well. I think I agree. And so I think like I give the authors like good credit for sort of putting this out as a progress report. I think they like, it's a really compelling 
um, you know, data set to collect or have, you know, kind of being taking that opportunity, given that there have been some interventions, um, veterinary like interventions to control the population to then start to take advantage of this sort of accidental experiment that's happened. And, you know, it might be as we're seeing, um, you know, in thinking about SARS-2 and just some of the tension or mismatches in the sort of the speed of science versus the speed of the news cycle. I think yeah, this is yeah, kind of yeah. refreshing that they're not trying to like rush out breathless results and say, you know, here's the, the, the smoking gun, but they're taking their time to, to really figure out, okay, let's understand what the population structure looks like so that we can lay the groundwork maybe for, for seeing what the impact might be in the future. Now, you didn't touch on the family structure yet, did you? Oh yeah, I don't think I did. So, um, uh, well, a little bit. So are you talking about the haplotypes, the pincher and the shepherds, or which part are you thinking about? Just here? family, yeah. just family connections between dogs from different oh, locations. Oh, sorry. You know, they, they, yeah. They, they yeah. basically identify 15 discrete families. Basically, you know, it's a, a unit where there's breeding going on. I mean, the, apparently males will breed, will mate with uh, any dog, but if, if there's geographical isolation, they tend to make families, right? Yeah. Oh, really um, good points. Yeah. So this is figure three. And right. um, this is now moving from identity by state to identity by descent. So can you make inferences just from the genetic data about who um, was the mother and father of the, right. you know, the, the and, and then um, in best case scenario, you can also identify like brother sibling pairs as well. Yeah. And so, yeah, this also gets at um, some important points that are going to definitely feed into population structure, population dynamics. So family one, um, you know, that's a lot of dogs. I forget the yeah. exact number here, but it's like half or more than half of the yeah. sample yeah. Yeah. of 300 dogs are part of the same family um, as defined by identity by descent. And so that also sort of hints at the high level of inbreeding or genetic relatedness, um, given that you have like most of these ones are direct relatives of each other tracing back for um, several decades here, um, yeah. but then some smaller families as well. Right. And so, and, um, and again, it's important to remember there's a sample. So these aren't like, you know, the ones that are two, that's, there's more to the dog pack or dog family, so to speak. Um, but this is all that's been sampled out of it so far, but the vast majority of them all fall. You can draw these sort of lines, yeah. family tree lines, um, and then color coded by location. Um, that also gives you a sense of the, um, gene flow. Again, the fact that you have, Dogs who are, you know, um, showing up at the power plant at the city who are part of the same family, basically. Yeah, that, thanks for bringing that up. I did miss that. It's an important part of the – that also sets the table. If you, by knowing the direct sort of um, relationships between the dogs, that can make your sort of scans for adaptation, scan for natural selection or artificial selection here. Um, uh, you get more signal from the noise. This helps define what those relationships are. And they also look to see whether they could see signatures from uh, breed-derived dogs, right, into this population, right? Modern breed contributions to these uh, dog populations. And uh, they do. They do find that because I think, um, you know, pincher, I think you mentioned pinchers. Mm -hmm. Pincher haplotypes make up 20% of the chromosome uh, and uh, a couple of other shepherds. Right. Exactly. Those are the main two contributors. This is that 23 and me of dogs sort of yeah, energy right. where they take advantage of all that info to sort of define um, what the Chernobyl breed, yeah. uh, the contributions right. basically from known. And so in haplotypes, so we didn't, I kind of probably glossed over that probably too quickly. So haplotypes now, instead of thinking about one position in the genome, you're thinking about shared variation across bigger regions. And so it still SNPs, but it's like this combination of 10 SNPs across a region of the genome, if they're all shared by, or if they're shared between two in the sample, they share that haplotype. It's a, it's a, a longer segment of the genome that they inherited, um, you know, separately. And so what happens is the more, the longer, so if you have, you know, if you start like way back in the past, um, the haplotypes, like the whole genome, and then, or it's, it sl slowly gets broken up by recombination with each generation um, as you go through um, sexual reproduction. And so that's the haplotypes get shorter the, the more time that goes on, or the less related you are. Yeah. And so this gives yeah. you some information again about relatedness, but also about sort of um, how long a haplotype has been maintained or, rem or remains. And so um, 
that is also like very useful information for like pointing out the spots to look for kind of adaptive signatures. Yeah. Yep. So a couple of their uh, discussion points are worth bringing up. So first of all, the conclusion is they've established that population of semi populations of semi feral dogs have been in this uh, Chernobyl area for many decades after uh, the accident. Yeah. Uh, and um, what, what they'd like to do now, of course, is to try and figure out um, if, if radiation exposure has had any mutational effect, because we don't know from this kind of analysis yet if there's if there's anything going on there. Yeah, exactly. So this is really the first step in uh, trying to figure out the, the impact of that radiation on um, free-living dogs, essentially, because that's what they are here, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I think in that STAT news article, there's a great quote by someone who wasn't involved in the study, but kind of um, uh, compared it to a cliffhanger, like a, you know, like you get, it's like, sort of like in, the, <laughs> in that TV series, you get to the end of the episode and you're just waiting for that big thing to happen. And it's like, okay, come back next, next episode and we'll see what the, what the payoff is. And that's, I agree with that assessment here. It feels like, okay, we've some table settings happened or you've, we've learned the characters, the cast, and now we'll see how biology has acted on them, how, how yeah. evolution has unfolded and, yeah, some interest. Yeah, some interesting hypotheses for sure about how radiation might influence the dynamics in the population, or even sort of influence the or impact or scar the genome as well. So they also say we unexpectedly found that within a small area, right, mm -hmm. zero, zero point two square kilometers, you got three family groups mm -hmm. existing, which is quite interesting. And they say w this shows the tendency of semi-feral dogs like their wild ancestors, to form packs of related uh, individuals. Um, and they, they exist very near to each other. And they say this is at odds with the generally territorial nature of the dog's ancestor, the gray wolf, right? Yeah. No, and this is, I'm glad you're raising this point too, Vincent, because this is, <laughs> I think this is pretty, you know, we talk about f like comparing to free ranging dog or free breeding dog populations. But the difference here is that, you know, for all of them or the majority of them, I don't, and um, again, I'll confess, I don't know all the details, but these dogs, even the free breeding ones are living around like not exclusion zones because they're living around humans. And so even if they're, the humans aren't sort of purposefully setting up mating pairs as part of a, a purebred um, dog scheme, there's, humans are still having a massive influence on how these dogs behave. And so I think that's what's potentially really different yeah, about yeah. this population, right? Is that the humans were kind of taken out of the equation or took themselves evacuated out of the equation by and large, not completely, but, but certainly different than any kind of, you know, even, you know, city or rural area where there's still humans just hanging out and influencing how the, you know, how the dogs are going to behave. Um, even if that's just like, you know, chasing them away from like trash cans or dumpsters or something like that's going to, how the dog, like that's has a big impact. And so, apparently, um, and yeah. so yeah. you'd think so, but I think that's also, you know, something you have to take into account in future work is if you're trying to discern, is there adaptation based on the radiation exposure or based on your interaction with another species, which has a huge impact on how you behave. You have to, I think you have to also kind of think about decoupling or accounting for those different potential sources um, of selection that aren't just one thing or another. They also mentioned that this study suggests that the Chernobyl dog populations violate the assumption of random mating that is inherent to many population genetic <laughs> models. Yeah, that's right. a great point. Like you should, we should, I think population geneticists love to, would love to sing that out at the mountaintops is that a lot of the assumptions in the models, um, uh, uh, you know, make these sort of hypothetical predictions that really are probably not going to live up to real life conditions. And if yeah, your simulations just... follow that, it can become sort of a circular <laughs> argument where, where it's like model simulation, but they have like, they can just sort of um, yeah. like a gather, uh, whatever, the rock rolling down the hill gathering moss, or I, I probably have that cliche wrong, but hopefully the point comes through. So I'm reading uh, the autobiography of Jacques Manot, and he said one one thing he said that I really like is, "I love fixed ideas, but only if they can be changed." <laughs> that's right. That's great. <laughs> and that's why yeah. he's a scientist, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how this this thing we've just said 
you know, it's a fixed idea that uh, um, random mating occurs, but uh, you have to be flexible because everything can change. That's there right. are very few things that are fixed, right? DNA, hey, DNA is the genetic material of most but not all things, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we yep. have viruses with RNA. So uh, we are always updating it. And people have issues with that because they think, oh, you're scientists, you're always changing your minds. That's the way science works. That's the yeah. way it has to work. You have, you cannot be wedded to something. You cannot think that uh, uh, what you believe in, fanatically believe in is right. You have to, and, and many scientists do, unfortunately, and it, it leads them down bad pathways. I agree. Yeah, and this I think this also is a nice demonstration of the scientific process of, the, of, of that progression. So it's like getting yeah, yeah, yeah. get the samples, then you get a foothold, and then you can build like – and so, again, credit, I think, to the authors for sort of getting the order right here. It's like – ready, aim, fire, instead of, um, we see a lot of fire, ready, aim science where you have an idea, like, or the danger is that you lose the scientific sort of energy or approach. If you have a conclusion in mind and then you bend the evidence to sort of, um, support that without actually, you know, thinking about, um, what, what how the data might be fooling you. And a lot of yeah. time that's not, that we don't really talk about that much in the scientific process is getting it right is the ready, aim um, phase yeah. of a project, which doesn't necessarily show up in a short report or something like that, even though it's probably 90% of the time. And so I think what this paper does nicely is it sort of peels back the curtain on that and shows you like, okay, here's years worth of effort to kind of get to the starting line of then the exciting, what might be perceived as the more exciting scientific questions to follow. The other, the other thing they say, a couple more things here. I want to just pull out of the discussion. First of all, yeah. They say dogs have clearly existed in, in the Chernobyl reason for a, region for a long time, maybe before the disaster. Maybe some of these dogs uh, survived the disaster and are uh, have contributed to the gene pool uh, mm -hmm. as well. So that's quite interesting, right? Yeah. And it is a... Um it's a hypothesis, the abandoned pet hypothesis. And like most hypotheses, there might, there's certain, you know, there might be real truth to it. And I think some evidence that emerged from this analysis so far, um, but there could be more going on here as well. In sort of cryptic sources of genetics is from the um, free living or free ranging dogs that were in and around that area. They also say that designing genome wide association studies to find radiation survival loci using yeah. conventional methods will be difficult in this population. Uh, yep. And they go, they'll go through a variety of reasons for that. So, um, yeah, it's not straightforward. Maybe that's why they publish this now because it might be a while <laughs> before they can yeah. get further, right? Yeah. Or is it the right data set? Um, does yeah. actually, if you keep sampling, so if there's more modern or you're sorry, not modern, but or more recent um, admixture events, more integration of dogs that haven't had a history in and around there, like the sampling might get. Uh, there might be sort of a Goldilocks effect where some of the um, population sort of structure actually is more useful for getting signal, but then it could get worse as you go on. And, and I think the entire size of the population sort of when the project began was about 800, which is already pretty small. And so you're not going to get, you know, in a lot of the geno geno genome wide association studies, the GWAS studies, um, you know, the more um, power you can get from, more samples, the better. There's sort of a ceiling here, I think, set um, based on that population level. And the fact that actually they're, the impetus for taking these samples is to actually spay and neuter a lot of these dogs so that the population doesn't kind of run out of control. And so that's now we're talking about a pretty intense human intervention um, in terms of limiting the breeding that would otherwise happen in the absence of humans. And so it's sort of changing the landscape of that population in real time. So, so basically, they feel that they still can't tell um, whether these dogs were reproductively isolated or um, they're free-roaming pets or both, you know, before the disaster. It's really too hard to sort that out. And there, there are very few contributions uh, from modern dogs into this population. So they're suspecting that they've been pretty isolated for a long time. And yep. that's quite interesting, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yep. But anyway, cool. the, the, why, we may want to know why they do this. They so their last sentence is, yeah. uh, the, the Chernobyl dog population has great potential 
for informing environmental resource management studies in a resurging population. Its greatest potential, however, lies in understanding the biological underpinnings of animal and ultimately human survival in regions of high and continuous environmental assault. There you go. Yeah, I agree. So it kind of ends on a slightly ominous but probably realistic note um, if we think hey. about <laughs> <laughs> that's what Fukushima. we do, with humans. Humans yeah, that's right. do, right? And are continuing to do. And so, um, this might be. Hopefully, you know, there aren't the fewer of these um, examples of sort of accidental um, population level dynamics. Um, the fewer, the better. Um, but I think that is right. That if we look at the trend lines, things are like it's probably more of these events like this, not fewer. And so, starting to get a handle on what are the parameters from a genetic standpoint will. Yeah, as they say, it could be a model or a useful um, approach thinking about the future. So Andrew says it would be interesting to see a comparative study of dogs in the Fukushima radioactive region. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I don't – so I, I know, and they point this out, that the amount of radiation and the sort of the size of the exclusion zone is a lot smaller. Yeah. Um, but I agree if that would be a, a kind of like an unfortunate like replication experiment in a sense with some differences as well. Yeah. Question not related. Do we know how, what genes tardigrades have that helps them survive harsh conditions? <laughs> yeah, that's right. You can throw these uh, little critters into space and they'll you know, vacuum and they'll still come back asking for more, kicking for more. I think there's like some active research going on in that area. I don't know how much of like a genetic basis that's gotten to. Um, and um, so, I'm, yeah, uh, there's, I mean, there's more info out there than I'm that's at the tip of my tongue. But um but that's also, I think, an active area of study where we're still kind of in the infancy of understanding sort of like what goes into being a bulletproof genome that can keep replicating despite exposure to really harsh environmental conditions. We don't want dogma in dog study. <laughs> that's right. And give the authors high marks, I think, for uh, avoiding that. Although maybe that would be like the title of a review article, um, like dispelling dogma in dog studies or something like that. Right. Yep. All right. That's it for our paper. Thanks for that, Barb. Mac UK. And as Janelle said, if you have a paper you think we might be interested in, send it along. Uh, yeah, that was that was great fun. Barb. Just anything that kind of captures your imagination. And this paper captured a lot of people's imagination. There's something about the dogs and our close relationship with that species that really speaks to, you know, not just sort of the professional scientists, but all of us as as uh, in our species as humans. And so great topic for conversation and for more exploration for sure right well now as we have one email why don't you take that yeah let's do this so this is um larry who writes i always enjoy listening to top scientists let their hair down and talk seriously but informally which is the allure of twix the podcast series for me and professors racchinello and LD do an outstanding job of that thank you larry um the february episode with nathan clark and the kind of analysis he and his team do is especially interesting. Indeed, <laughs> finer than a frog's hair split three ways. Anyway, I was hoping that the topic of hair as sensor would come up, particularly the tiny hairs inside the cochlea, but I don't think it was mentioned. In digging further uh, with uh, Britannia articles on sound reception, I was surprised to learn that some non-mammals also use hair the hair sensilia in arthropods, for example, for hearing, including in the cochleas of crocodiles and birds. I don't want to get <laughs> into anyone's hair, but do you happen to know whether there are examples of, or these are examples of convergent evolution, or is there a common ancestor that produced hair, which we've since adapted and put to a multitude of uses? Thanks as always. This is Larry West, who's a software developer and fanboy from San Diego. Uh, P.S. Perhaps hearing loss organizations would be interested in funding uh, related research by doctors um, Kowal Kowalczyk, uh, Chikina, and Clark. Yeah, Larry, thanks for your letter. Do you want to tackle this one first? Vincent, hair, conversion evolution of hair? I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know, I know much. That, <laughs> I know that uh, you can study the role of hair and and. Uh, herring and zebrafish. Many there are people out there who do that. Yeah, exactly. Um, good so model ancient. system. I think so. The key here might be um, defining 
sort of, um, you know, what we mean by convergent evolution. So functional convergence where, um, you know, like sort of perceptions might be like even the hair sort of from hair follicles where perceptions of, um, touch and, mm. and things like that can sort of, uh, are happening versus hairs in the cochlea, um, where you're also perceiving something different. You could make a case that the function is the same, even though sort of the, the mechanics or the mechanism or the, co you know, the complex of proteins and related factors, um, keratins, chitins, whatever it is, are coming together, um, in different ways to, to exercise that biology. I think there's like the, actually the arthropods are a great example. I think there's like, you know, in, in terms of, um, perceiving vibrations, sounds, et cetera, there's like many cases of conversion evolution where like the equivalent of cochleas or ears, which is probably being a, a little too complicated for what some of these structures are, but they're showing up at different parts of like different appendages and things like that. And they've done so, um, independently in different lineages. Um, so I think the answer is yes, but it also, but the, how you define con conversion evolution, um, really matters here. And so what, like, you know, in some shared toolbox of genes, um, which would be sort of genetic convergence, um, where the same genes encode the same proteins that then, mm. um, are, end up work like performing the equivalent functions. That's probably a more complicated scenario where there are some of, where there are genes, from ancestors, shared ancestors that are then put to use um, for some of these um, hair-like or hair sensory functions, um, but get there also with different sort of, they bring in other other genes or gene products come in independently to get sort of, so there's, it's kind of a hybrid case of divergent evolution from some of the same toolbox, but with convergent contributions um, along the way as, as you go um, farther into the future, um, or as these populations diverge from each other as different species, different lineages, and even different kingdoms of life in some cases. Well, a couple of years ago, there was an article on a, a study showing that, uh, scales, feathers, and hair had a common ancestor. <laughs> yeah. Right? So that's, yeah, that's, yeah. And there, so the like hairs and cochlea are probably different than the hairs, even though we might, you know, look at the morphology and say, well, a feather yeah. and, a in the hair on our head seem very different. And yet even more different are the hairs that are then sort of, you know, or the hair like structures that are in place in the cochlea. And so that, yeah, just how our eyes perceive or our brains like define things can kind of fool us when we are um, defining this, which is another reason that, you know, the evolution here and, and thinking about that analysis, thinking about the definitions, I think actually becomes really important to better describe the biological reality. Maybe we should get a hair expert here. Talk about this. <laughs> yeah, I've got some buddies who are who work on this. Um, yeah, the next time a evolution related story comes out, let's let's we'll get, we'll keep that right. on our radar for let's sure. Do that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. Great letter. Thanks for listening. Glad you're enjoying these conversations. So there's a comment here from uh, Nicole who said Chernobyl is on a league of its own as far as radiation release. The fact that it burned for days is unique to that kind of reactor. So I don't know anything about this. Maybe you could. Elaborate there, Nicola, RBMK, yeah, and why it's unusual that it burned for days. And yeah, well, and, you, and this is like one of those cases where you hope there isn't a great comparison point, right? Like another Chernobyl level yeah, right, right. accident is nothing you want to mess with. Um, I was just as we we're um, as you uh, as Barb um, as you suggested this um, paper, and Vincent and I were kicking it around. I actually just went did a quick Google Maps search of Chernobyl. Um, to remind myself of the geography there. So, you know, kind of halfway between Kiev and the Belarusian border, um, you can almost see the exclusion zone based on the cities that are the towns that aren't around there compared to the density of towns. And there was a point on the map, you know, the monument to people who saved the world. I think the, the monument is, is called, and this, you know, these are the first responders, right. Who are there risking their lives or, giving their lives in order to try to contain mm. this, um, what was an awful disaster, but could have even been worse. Um, and so there's, you know, something like 2000 photos in and around that area, just on the Google maps and big recommendation to take a peek at that. It's really fascinating to see some of the, you know, what, when, a, when humans abandon towns and, and a small city, what the sort of consequences look like 30 years on. And, and now as and like the authors pointed out in the paper as well, more people are coming by, including tourists who are just curious about like, what is, what does the world look like here after the nuclear disaster? 
So, you know, we had one here in the U.S. at Three Mile Island, but I guess nobody really has done any kind of environmental studies like this. Maybe it wasn't big enough, right? Yeah, different scale, I think, by sort of orders of magnitude. But I confess yeah. I don't yeah, know a lot of the details there as well. I mean, they've been looking at, at people, right? It's easy to look mm -hmm. for increases in cancers and so forth. But this, yeah. And so that was uh, in 1979 when um, – we didn't have a lot of the methods we have now, right? Exactly. Good point. Yep. So Nicola says, sure, it's because they use graphite as a moderator. Normally, mm. Western reactors use water. Mm. Graphite burned for days, basically, making a radioactive bonfire that pushed re radioactivity around. Okay. Yeah, good. Yep. And and it's, you know, it's that massive zone, exclusion zone, but there's also, you know, obviously in neighboring countries. So this is, I think this is, you know, still the Soviet Union before the borders changed or the collapse of the Soviet Union into Russia and then Ukraine, et cetera. But um, all kinds of uh, radioactive exposure throughout Europe, neighboring countries, mm -hmm. and even, I think, you know, getting to North America. And so a, tr a truly international global impact to this one. Pete says also the 1957 wind scale incident, quite a big release then, mm. right? Yep. So here I think we're getting into the a lot of the nuclear weapons testing as well and, and how that's, yep. That's, and that's, he says, the, sorry, go ahead. No, go. Oh, I was just going to say that hits a little closer to my neighborhood here in southern Utah, some of the deserts where the um, population, so-called downwinders, are living. Wind played an enormous role. While it would normally drift east-northeast across Russia, we would have never heard about it. However, the winds changed and blew west. Yep. Yeah. And back to Nicola. The reason is that it was originally designed to breed plutonium, no containment building. Yeah, wow. So it was a weapons building, basically, right? Mm. There you go. You make biological weapons, uh, you kill yourself, you make... Nuclear weapons, yep. Yeah, so on that um, sort of positive note, but <laughs> <laughs> we can move on to our science picks of the week, which actually my pick has a um, um, sort of ecological impact as well on a smaller scale, although still a very serious one. And so um, I came across through um, social media a documentary it's called Hellbent. It's about hellbender salamanders, which are these fascinating critters, these big salamanders you find in North America. Um, I think there's beautiful animals. Um, and so this documentary, though, it's short, I think it's about 20 minutes. Um, and it um, takes the view of how um, a community banded together sort of in support of the hellbender. Um, this is in Pennsylvania, a small town, um, to motivate, you know, a real conversation or get some attention mm. to trying to block a um, uh, uh, fracking well for gas exploration, gas and oil exploration, um, at the potential expense of clean drinking water and habitat for the hellbender. And so, um, this is a case where like clear running streams are really essential for this. It's just, the species is sensitive to things like debris and also the quality of the water. And so, um, you know, it's sometimes as humans, it seems like our species and just as we were talking about with Chernobyl and some of the impulses of one species can kind of overwhelm the bigger picture. But I think it's actually, you know, maybe one of the powerful things about this study with the dogs is when we sort of think about, you know, the, the impact that we're having, not just on each other, but like, you know, on nature or the, in the case of dogs, animals that we've, um, you know, domesticated, lived with for tens of thousands of years and become really close to and sort of that value or that inherent human um, you know, value that comes from nature. And I think we all sort of share that thread or some of that understanding. And so, you know, that's, I think one of the potentially powerful things, why this is my pick of the week is to highlight these sort of just beautiful animals and, you know, and dogs fall into that category as well, I would say. Neat. Yeah. And one other, sorry to um, kind of dominate the science pick moment here. I had one other uh, note, I guess it's more of a science note than a pick that I wanted to bring up. Um, and this just, um, again, also um, came on my radar just in the last week. There, someone deposited on the bioarchive a response to one of the papers that we covered recently. So this is... Oh, yeah. It's right. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is Tuivo episode 84, Decoding Our Defenses to the Black Death. Um, 
And so a really interesting study that tries to, to look at sort of the recent human past in, in Europe, I think in Denmark and in the UK, um, as the Black Plague was moving through and then identifies or promotes a, a, one gene in particular, ERAP, um, for signals of adaptive evolution that might be sort of a strong selective, a strong selective sweep proposed mm. to have been imposed by the Black Death. And so we talked about this a little bit, Vincent. So, you know, the signals of selection were really high. And then there was a little, not quite sleight of hand, but there was, you know, the, the signal they looked at was different from the SNPs that have been sort of functionally, like it sort of was a little loose in that part of the paper. Um, the paper could still hold up, but so anyway, sorry, this preprint, I should say, um, calls into question some of the statistical approaches there. So the title of the, um, the preprint, and we'll put this up in the show notes, the bioarchive link, is insufficient evidence for natural selection associated with the Black Death. And they're specifically looking at this study and pointing out four issues, they think, um, that comes through in the statistical analysis that, you know, things like how you do multiple testing or don't do that in, in order to sort of get a sense of the, the impact and mm -hmm. also, yeah, some of those other sort of features. And so I wanted to lift this up. So we'll see, I think the authors themselves will, will likely respond sooner than later, sure. obviously with, sure. with a rebuttal, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, and we'll see where it goes. But I think this is also a really great illustration of how science works when it's working well. So it's not that we get as scientists that we get it right in the first go. We, we just try to, we, if it's a sincere study and I would hold up that this one is, um, but there, it could have flaws in its statistical approaches mm -hmm. are being pulled out here. And so, you know, if that, if that interests any of our listeners, I think this is a great example for sort of peeking under the hood of, of how the scientific process might work when it's sort of, you know, when the conversations are happening in a productive way. And so, um, you know, you could listen to 84 if you, uh, or if you haven't already, um, or look at the paper and then look at the preprint and then probably the rebuttal from the authors and really see that back and forth of, I think it's a really nice sort of illustration of the scientific process that's sort of unfolding for us in real time. Hmm. Yep. That's science. Can't be fixed on your theories. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's science. So we'll see where that one goes. But anyway, so those are my two science picks of the week. How about you, Vincent? What's what's on your radar here? Uh, so my pick is related to what I'm doing today. So I'm hmm. <clears throat> going to uh, give tomorrow a lecture to journalism students at the Columbia School of Journalism. And uh, actually, next week is my usual virology lecture that I give to them. But they asked me to come also a week earlier and give them some basic molecular biology. So you know, I don't have a lot of slides on that because uh, when it comes to viruses, I get them from my textbook. So I, w I went to BioRender and got a lot of slides from them. Many of you know about this, BioRender.com, but mm -hmm. um, people make images and they put them there. And there's uh, usually something that you'd like to use and maybe modify. You can sign up for free with some watermarks where you can subscribe like I do for Microbe TV. And uh, it's a very useful place to get uh, images of all kinds, and you can use them in slides. And, you know, I find I just have to put an image up, and I can talk for 20 minutes without any problem. So <laughs> that's the solution to my making a new lecture, BioRender. Yeah. Yep, this is great. This is kind of revolutionized um, <clears throat> giving a science talk where yeah, a lot sure. of science we, – we use this in my lab as well, have a subscription, and um, just sort of breaks down that barrier of, well, I'm not good at drawing – stuff on computers. And so there's just like a whole catalog, right, of things you can just draw on and, and sort of take that part, um, make that kind of clean, like cleanly communicate the biology with those images and then talk yeah. more about the ideas. Yeah, it's, that's cool. Uh, we have a listener pick from Walter. Love your podcast. Wouldn't Oded Rishavi be a cool guest? And uh, Walter provides a couple of links. Fascinating overlap of virology, genetics, and neuroscience. Yeah, thanks, Walter. This is a great suggestion. Um, you know him also, and else? Well, so I I don't know if we've met actually. Um, I know his work a little bit, um, and and um, he also is probably um, social media famous for his work on um, mm. Twitter, where he'll post <laughs> images, provocative images, and link it to sort of the scientific lifestyle. And so he's he's really a master of these kind of of taking memes or images or short clips and then kind of yeah. um, revealing the the culture of science yeah really uh, smart 
exciting scientist. That's a great, great suggestion, Walter. We'll keep our eyes open for a good, a good moment to, to invite him. I just want to uh, pick pick out this email, uh, this t text from Nicole. If anyone's interested, there's a nice book by Sonia Schmidt, Producing Power, that tells the story of Soviet nuclear reactors and why they went with that bad choice of reactor for power generation. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Nicola. Thanks, Nicola. All right, so now I need to leave and go teach my virology course. I have to get a subway <laughs> uptown, and Ooh. so uh, I need to leave now. So thanks, everybody, for coming. If you haven't already hit the thumbs up, please do. It helps uh, get more people here to hear what we're doing. I want to thank our moderators today, Vanity, uh, Les, Andrew, Barb Mac, UK, uh, and Tom. I think I got them all there. Thank you for Very coming. Cool. Thanks, everybody else, for coming. Uh, tonight yeah. we have at 8 p.m. Eastern live stream Q&A with A&V. Amy's for, back for her monthly visit. Oh, nice. So if you're, if you're interested in viruses, check that out. And uh, thank you, Nels, for joining me again. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Vincent. This is really fun. Special shout out to Barb Mack for the paper suggestion today. Thanks to all our moderators and thanks to everyone for being with us, uh, really enjoying these conversations once a month. Let's do it again next time. Yeah, we'll be back next month, roughly in a month. Nels and I will get together and uh, figure out a date. Meanwhile, stay safe, everyone. Hope to see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.